Okay, so your chemo that means greetings. My name is Ojirafo Kwesi Rane Mbata Akan. So I wanted to do this video to share with members of our, not just our Patreon group, but also those who have subscribed to us on YouTube, as well as those who have followed us either over the years or people who are just, you know, new to our channel. We are producing, if you have seen a featured film, and let me go right direct to the information. Okay, so you see here, we did a 13-part series um, at the end of February, beginning of March, called When a Woman Stalks a Man, Legal System, Mental Illness, Spirit, Children, and Hoodoo. So what I do in this 13-part series, in total is four hours and 14 minutes, but we have a, you know all 13 parts on YouTube. You can watch that if you haven't seen it. What I'm doing is chronicling... Um, there's a mentally ill woman who's been stalking me for the past five and a half years. So let's just show some highlights of what has taken place. You see the subtitle, Legal System, Mental Illness, Spirit, Children, and Hoodoo. All of these subjects, you know, converge in this five and a half year journey. So. So I talk about detailing my experience being stalked five and a half years. It has resulted in two anti-stalking orders. The first one was um, for two years and then we renewed it in January for another two years. Um, criminal convictions for the individual inclusive of incarceration. Now, I say my personal experience of being stalked online in person and subsequently navigating the legal system in civil court and criminal court with the mentally ill stalkers who is very litigious. We elucidate all of that in our 13 part series. I wanna show some, let's say a snapshot. Um, she's filed multiple cases in civil court as well as petitioning the appellate court and the Supreme Court. Let me show you that right now. Okay, let me make sure you can see this. Okay, so as you can see, Supreme Court of the United States. And you see the petitioner versus Kwesi Khan. We'll get into the reason why she started using my last name, even though that's not her last name. Uh, decision date for the original case was October 2nd. She filed a petition with the appellate court, which was rejected. She petitioned the Supreme Court, a petition for a writ of certiorari, and that was November 13th. It was distributed for a conference on February 16th. And you can see here, February 20th of this year, her petition was denied by the Supreme Court. Now, let me switch over to another document. Gonna switch over to the appeals court document right quick. Okay, so as you can see, DC Court of Appeals received on uh, April 25th, a few weeks ago, this is my, the appellee's brief 
and I'm responding to her brief. So this once again, um, she filed a defamation suit, a frivolous defamation suit. I responded to that. She said I defamed her by calling her mentally ill and a stalker. Of course, she was convicted in court and went to jail for stalking me and so forth. She was um, ordered to undergo a psychiatric evaluation, was found to have a mental illness. She was diagnosed with a mental illness by a psychiatrist. So of course, our statements weren't defamatory. I filed a motion for summary judgment. The case was thrown out. She's appealing that case with the appellate court now. Of course, she's gonna lose that appeal. She'll probably try to appeal it once again to the Supreme Court and she'll lose that case as well. So just to, so you understand the litigious nature of this individual. Now, let's go back. So to give some background. She also filed motions to dismiss her criminal defense attorney um, in order to represent herself in criminal court. Her motions were granted and she therefore operated as her own attorney. Now, uh, how did all of this start? Just want to give you a quick little background and why we're putting this movie out. I'm an author. I've published 31 books on various um, expressions of Afurakani, Afurakani, or African ancestry, religion, culture, nation building, heritage, holistic health, and so forth. Lectured around the country and so forth. We've been doing this kind of work for the past 20 years. All 31 of the books, the ebook versions, are free downloads from our website. So you can download those, you can access them, you can access our courses. I've uh, produced two documentary films, one a few years ago in October of 2018, and then just recently in October of 2023, we released our second film. We're going to get into that. Um, so, you know, people download our books, they take our online courses and so forth. Um, we have an annual conference in Washington, D.C. in March dealing with ancestral religion and its um, retentions in African-American culture, so to speak. So we do that every year. Um, this individual attended that conference a few years back. That was the first time I ever came in contact with this individual. She attended the conference just like anybody else. She traveled from the state of Kansas to Washington, D.C. to attend our conference. That's not unusual or uncommon. People come from various states to attend our conferences and so forth. At the end of the conference, when everybody's standing around talking and you know exchanging information, she introduced herself and said, hey, I just want to let you know I appreciate your work and I've been reading your books and I appreciate what you're doing. We had like a two minute conversation. That was it. First time I ever came in contact with this individual. A year later, we had a, another conference that we do annual um, in South Carolina. She attended that. She participated in the workshops and the conference just like anybody else. Um, we didn't have any personal interaction. That was the second time I came in contact with that individual. Six months later, she sent me a very detailed email letting me know that the Supreme Being and the ancestral spirits assigned her as my divine complement or twin flame. She incarnated to be with me and she's revealing that we incarnated to be together. And she was flooded with ancestral messages over a period of time and she had an experience of having my child and it affected her so thoroughly that her body took weeks to recover and all these different things. Um, of course, it's misinformation, but, you know, misinterpretation, but this is what she was saying. She said she knew was, when she first logged onto the website, she knew I was the one even before she saw me and she told her children at that point. I was the only person in the world that she trusted and if anything ever happened to her for them to contact me before she ever saw me on the website, just logging in. So of course that's nonsense. Um, I responded in a very respectful manner. That email exchange became part of the criminal case as well as the civil case. So it's public record and so forth. And we show that in the 13 part series in detail. So I just responded letting her know that, you know, there are different ways that people can misinterpret spiritual messages, especially if they go through some traumatic events. And of course, this is what has happened. I'm not her divine compliment and so forth. She responded by thanking me. She said, you know, I have been going through something very traumatic and that's right around the time I saw your website. I appreciate your detailed response. I didn't mean any, you know, disrespect and peace to you and your divine compliment. 
didn't mean to, you know, encroach upon anything. And I responded, no problem, you know, that happens and so forth. So that was a respectful exchange. Uh, four weeks later, she took a bus for 20 hours from the state of Kansas with her three teenage sons and showed up on my doorstep. I never gave her my address. She never told me she was coming to the city. If she did, I would have told her, I don't know where you're going to stay, but you can't stay with me, of course. Um, we knew she was, you know, unstable when she came to that conference, but, you know, it's not against the law to be unstable. But of course, after the email and her, you know, declaring that I'm her divine complement to inflame a sign by the Supreme Being, she also states later in lawsuits that, uh, not only am I her divine complement or twin flame, but we won't be assigned any other divine complement in this incarnation or any future incarnations. So, um, so she showed up at my home. I did not allow her in, of course. She had to go back to Kansas with her sons and take another 20 hour ride back to the state of Kansas. And let's look here what we say, a quick little wrap up. Series of events began over five years ago. This is what I'm talking about. Yeah, you know, I just mentioned here. So we go through some of that. Um, let me scroll down a little bit. Of course, she spent all of her money on a one-way ticket, and then she was at you know at my home, so she had no more money and she had no place to go. According to her, trying to force her way in. It's assuming that I wouldn't turn them away, which of course I did. Um, so she was forced to go back to Kansas and for the next three years, she started a three year cyber stalking campaign. She started using my last name. I blocked her from all social media and so forth. So I didn't know what she was doing. She was using my last name. She was copying and pasting my books all over her website. People were thinking that we must be, you know, married because we have the same last name and we're promoting the same information and so forth. And now, She put forward this false notion. She says, she, the stalking including weaving the tale of having been enslaved for 40 years in the human trafficking ring and only being able to break free by studying and incorporating the practice of hoodoo that she learned by studying the books I've authored and published on ancestry, religion, culture, anthropology, and more. She also claimed that her oldest son was murdered by decapitation by the human traffickers and that there is now a young man that they put forward as an imposter to pretend like he's really her son, but he's really not her son. The white Jewish mafia human traffickers are putting him forward as an imposter to fool the world that he's really her son, but her real son was decapitated and she was forced to view the decapitated head of her son by a white male agent posing as an early morning jogger and they brought her before this um, agent posing as a jogger. When he opened up his backpack, the head of her son was in the backpack. You know, she's making up all this nonsense, pretending like she was enslaved for 40 years with her children and she was trying to escape slavery. And that's why she came to my house and so forth. She tried to use this manufactured human trafficking story to get out of this anti-stalking order and later the criminal convictions. So pure nonsense, but she wove a number of different tales. Now, she also wove a tale about being the true owner of a black township in Kansas. She's suing the state of Kansas for billions of dollars. She says she has a town. She sent letters to the Jackson County clerk in that region of Kansas and so forth, telling them that the people living in that town had a certain number of days to leave town or else she's gonna sue them for billions of dollars. But if they wanna stay, um, they can pay up to 22% of their income to rent their property to her and so forth. She created a website, all kinds of nonsense, a township website with tabs like garbage pickup day. And you can open up a business in this black town. You can apply for a business license. And she's charging for business licenses to open up a business in this black town that doesn't exist that she claims to own and so forth problem with that is she was putting she put my name as a member of the board of trustees of this fake town so it's a scam of course people are thinking wow there's a black town like black wall street 
I would love to open up a black business and have my business, you know, centered in this black township where it's going to be economic development, empowerment for black people. Total fraud. But she had my name and my face, my picture as a member of the board of trustees and all kinds of nonsense. So once I found that out, I put out a public service announcement on Facebook saying we're not affiliated with this individual. She's mentally ill, unstable, scam artist, and so forth. So that was going on for three years online. And we had to put out a number of fires online to make sure people knew that we were not affiliated with this individual. Plus when people would read the website and so forth, they saw she was using my last name and copying and pasting my books and so forth and articles and using some of the, you know, nomenclature that we employ in our work. But then of course she was also unstable. So they're like, okay, are they connected? But she's kind of crazy sounding, but then she is using his last name and she does use the same, you know, terminology that they use. Maybe they are connected. Maybe it's something wrong with that entire organization. So we had to let people know this is a mentally ill individual who's also a scam artist. So after three years of that, she decided to return to Washington, D.C. to stalk me once again in person, showing up at my house on multiple occasions. The police were called. Um, eventually, they directed me to, you know, submit a petition for an anti-stalking order. I did that. After she evaded being served a summons for a number of months, she was finally served. I was granted a two-year anti-stalking order. Within months, she violated that order. A criminal contempt charge was filed. Um, we went to court. Of course, she was found guilty. She petitioned to represent herself in court. So I was on the stand. The prosecution asked questions about what took place and so forth. And when, when it was time for me to be cross-examined by the defense attorney, her representation, she had asked for her attorney to be dismissed. So she was functioning as her own defense counsel. So now she, the stalker, is cross-examining me about her stalking me. And this is going on in criminal court, Superior Court, DC. Of course, she was found guilty. She was sentenced to six months of incarceration, uh, but it was suspended contingent upon her completing one year of probation. In one week, she violated the probation. So we were back in court a couple of months later. She was found guilty of violating probation. She represented herself in court as her own attorney again, but the law wasn't on her side. She was found guilty. She was handcuffed in the courtroom and she was taken to prison. She was there for a certain period. After she was released about five weeks later, she violated the court order once again. Um, and then a new criminal contempt charge was filed and we have been going back and forth with that criminal contempt charge, you know, since October. The trial should have taken place this past October, but through manipulation, she was able to get it pushed to November and then January and then February. Now, um, one of the things, by the way, she did with regard to manipulation, she reached out to a human trafficking victims organization, told her a fraudulent story about being human trafficked, and then they sent an attorney, pro bono, who represents human trafficking victims. They were gonna represent her in court. When this attorney talked to me before going before the judge, I was able to give insight and it confirmed what the attorney felt herself. She felt like the story had a bunch of holes and it just didn't add up. So they told the judge that we're not gonna be able to represent this individual, but she stole resources from real human trafficking victims who need that you know, counsel need that representation, wasting an entire morning down at the courthouse trying to utilize that, you know, to get herself out of this criminal conviction. That's just one of the things that took place. In the midst of that, she filed a defamation suit against me, filed multiple motions with nearly a thousand pages of fraudulent information about human trafficking and decapitations and escaping from slavery and all kinds of nonsense, which we get into in the 13-part series. So all of that is taking place. As I said, that particular um, um, case, you know, I won that case. Motion for summary judgment was granted. It was thrown out. 
She filed an appeal and we're in the pellet phase right now. She also appealed the original anti-stalking order that went up to the appellate court, then the Supreme Court, that was denied. Now, she's in, in the process of appealing this case and she's also appealing the criminal conviction as well as she's trying to push that through the appellate court and Supreme Court right now. Recently, um, she violated the court order again, March 13th, we were back in court. She was incarcerated, but she was also ordered to undergo a mental competency evaluation by the new judge. She's already diagnosed with a mental illness, but this has to do with competence in court. According to the, you know, the way the judge felt, maybe her mental health has deteriorated to the point that she can no longer represent herself in court. Um, she was incarcerated. She was evaluated. She was found incompetent to stand trial. She was transferred from the prison to the mental health hospital for 40 days to be under observation. So her competency can be restored. Uh, we came back to court on February 25th. It was determined by the attending physician that her competency had not yet been restored. She was still incompetent to stand trial, but they feel like if she undergoes some more treatment, she can possibly have her competency restored and be able to stand trial and so forth. So she was taken back to the mental health hospital where she is right now. June 20th is our next court date. If she's found to be competent, then she will go and you know stand trial. And of course she's going to lose and she, she will be going to jail for at least a year. But in the midst of all that, she's following these you know multiple motions and so forth, a number of different things. Uh, one of the main things is She's stating that because the biological fathers of her children, she conceived those children under duress, you know, through rape, according to her, which is inaccurate, but that's what she's saying. Um, therefore, the biological children's children, according to her, or the biological fathers, according to her, can't be the real fathers since they conceived and forced her to conceive these children through rape. Um, only the spiritual divine complement or twin flame can be the real father. So she told the judge that because of that principle, by default, I am the true spiritual father of her three children. The biological fathers aren't the real fathers. And in the defamation lawsuit, she asked the judge to order that I pay 18 years of back child support for her three sons because I'm the real father. And she went through a whole detailed analysis of this foolish fraudulent principle, pseudo spiritual principle, try to get the judge to force me to pay 18 years of back child support, $637,000 she was asking for. In the most recent um, brief that she filed with the appellate court, and she's in the mental hospital, so she doesn't have access to a computer. So she did a handwritten three page brief and mailed it to the appellate court. This time she's saying, actually, my sperm was stolen by an ex and it was sold to the human traffickers. And in turn, they took the, hu the sperm, these human traffickers, the white Jewish mafia, she calls them, and used that to impregnate her. So actually, her three sons are biologically really my three sons. So I am the biological father now. After making the argument in court that I was just the spiritual father, all of it is foolishness, but we've been going back and forth to court for the past two and a half years. Out of this five and a half years, the court process, the past two and a half. I've been before a judge 17 times in two and a half years. It's coming to a close, but it's not finished yet. So I was going to, tell my story, that 13 part series, I was gonna do that back in October because our trial date was October 25th. She was gonna, of course, lose the case. She was gonna be incarcerated for, le for at least a year. It would finally have been over five years of stalking. I was gonna tell my story in a very short, maybe half an hour, you know, video. But because it was through manipulation, like with the human trafficking victims lawyer and then her heart, you know, firing or dismissing her attorney at the next court date. Then it was pushed back to January. 
And then right before that court date, she said, okay, I want that attorney back to represent me. Then they had to give her more time for him to you know, prepare for the case. So all these machinations to keep pushing this court date back. I was gonna tell my story in October, but there was a couple of things that made me say at this recent court date um, in February that, you know what? It's time for me to tell my story now. And I put out the 13 part series. On February 20th, the assistant attorney general who's prosecuting the case, the criminal case, she sent me an email updating me on what happened that day on February 20th in court. It was a status hearing and they had assigned her a new attorney. So also on February 20th, let me go back real quick. So, also on February 20th, of course, once again, you see the Supreme Court docket. And it was February 20th that her petition for the writ of Sergio Arari was denied by the Supreme Court. That happened. But then also another thing happened. And this ties directly into why I put out the 13 part series at the time, but what also led to me recognizing that I needed to make this not just a 13 part series, but a film to bring some light on how people can weaponize the legal system, can weaponize, you know, human services agencies and so forth to, you know, cause a great deal of problems for someone. You're stalking someone, but you can stalk them with the legal system, not just showing up at their home, but you can use the legal system to stalk somebody for another couple of years. If you can't stalk them at their home, or you can't stalk them online, you can use the legal system to force them to respond, force them to come to court. The only way you can see them legally is if you file a frivolous lawsuit and then the person has to come to court and you get a chance to exchange with them and see them at least then, that's a form of stalking as well. Most times when people are being stalked, one out of every three adult women are stalked in their lifetime, which is insane. And then we found the statistics that one out of every six men are stalked in their lifetime, adult men, which is also insane. We don't often hear about what happens when a woman stalks a man. And then the whole notion of spirit children and who do and so forth, a lot of things have taken place. And the information we just talked about, not even 20% of the story she's told in these lawsuits. But let me switch over to another piece right quick. Okay. So you may be familiar with the sister Risa Tisa. If you're not, it's a phenomenon. Um, over the February 14th, the Valentine's Day weekend, so-called Valentine's Day weekend this year, she released a series. So what she did was she told her story is called Why the F, or Who the F Did I Marry? She talks about meeting someone, they developed a strong relationship, they got engaged, they got married, and then she found out over time, you know, a number of different red flags became to, you know, came to be. She would ultimately find out that this individual was mentally ill, but every single thing about their life, about his life, about his family, about his job, about all, everything was a total fabrication to the point where she didn't know who exactly did she actually marry. She told the story in a very chronological, meticulous, and, and brilliant way. Over the course of a few days, she had to upload these videos. You can see her, for example, here sitting in her car. All she did was she took her iPhone, she would record a 10 minute segment. TikTok only allowed you to do 10 minutes at the time. Um, and she told her story over the series of a number of 10 minute segments. She ended up having to do 50 10 minute segments, 500 minutes, no music, no videos, no documents and so forth. She just set up her iPhone and told her story. She did it brilliantly and she impacted and, you know, made a lot of people aware of what's going on. 
and helped a lot of people as well. Within about a week and a half, she had 200 million views on TikTok. A week later, she had 400 million views. This is a number of images of the sister, but you'll see ABC News, CNN, People, Tamron Hall show. So within a couple of weeks, by the end of February, beginning of March, she was on the Tamron Hall show. She was on Good Morning America with Robin Roberts. She was on CNN. She was on all these different um, outlets. She ended up getting signed with the, the largest talent agency in the country and so forth. It was showing that people, when you have real content that has real life consequences, people are interested because it actually impacts their lives. If you would have told somebody prior to this that, hey, I have a, a series on TikTok that's 500 minutes, seven hours, I want you to listen to it. Most people have said, I don't have time to do that. But the way she told her story and because it was so poignant and the subject matter was real, hundreds of millions of views within a few weeks. And the way she told her story about this mentally ill individual that she will later find out was mentally ill, but she didn't know that you know, during the course of the marriage until it began, maybe began to become apparent. It was very similar in a certain sense to what I've been dealing with for the past five and a half years. The only difference is I've been forced to go back and forth to court, you know, for two and a half years on the criminal side and the civil side and having to fight lawsuits. And then the whole notion of hoodoo and spirit children and, and so forth. So, I finished watching, it took me a couple of days to go through her whole 50 par series. I actually finished watching the final segment on February 20th. And right after that, I received the email from the Assistant Attorney General updating me on what happened in court that same day. And then I found that in the Supreme Court on the civil side, um, the petition was denied when she was trying to overturn the civil case, the defamation case. The criminal court side also happened on February 20th. So those three things, information from the criminal court on February 20th, um, the denial from the Supreme Court for the civil case on February 20th, and me also, you know, finishing up the sister's brilliant, you know, 50 par series. I realized then that I need to tell my story as well. I could help a number of different people even just through this whole notion of when she was um, evading being served a summons and I had to go to the jurisdiction where she was staying at a woman's shelter and call the police and then they come and pick up the serving documents and they try to serve her at the shelter and the person at the front desk says, oh, we, we can't confirm or deny if anybody is here by that name. Then I had to go back another day and meet with the police and they come get the documents and they go to the person, and there's a different person at the front desk. They're like, oh yeah, she's here every day. We know her. Um, she's not here tonight. Just come back tomorrow. She'll be here. Went back the next night, called the police. They come get the documents from me. They go into the place. There's a different person at the front desk. They're like, we've never heard of this person. She was evading service, telling certain people at the front desk, if somebody tries to serve me with a summons to appear in court, just tell them you don't know anything. So she was able to evade service for a while. I had to go back to court initially and ask for the case to be dismissed because I wasn't able to serve her with the serving documents so she couldn't come to court and so forth. And they couldn't keep giving me continuances. And the day after the case was dismissed, the anti-stalking order case was dismissed, I came home, I opened my door and there was a document on my floor meaning she had come back into my condo building, which is a locked building. She got inside the building somehow. She slipped a document under the door. And in the document, she was saying, if you don't meet with me, I'm gonna sue you. And then she had a printout of the entire, entire court docket showing every single time I had met before a judge, including the day before when I asked for the case to be dismissed. And she was you know, showing that for a number of weeks, she knew that I was coming to have her served. She was evading service. She knew every time I had a court date, she made sure she didn't go to the court date, of course, because she didn't. if not served the summons, you don't have to appear. And as soon as the case was dismissed, then she popped up at my house once again. 
So her thing was, I'm just going to evade service and show up at his house whenever I want to. And even if he calls the police, I'll disappear before they can find me. And I'm homeless, so it's hard to find me. I can pop up whenever. But eventually, I asked for a motion. I filed a motion for alternative service, meaning if you can't serve the person at their residence or job or wherever, if you made a diligent effort, the judge will say, you made a diligent effort, you can prove that. I will allow you to serve this person through email and text message. And once that motion was granted and I had the evidence to prove that we made a diligent effort, including this event of her showing up at my home and sliding the printout of the court docket, showing that she knew every time I went to court and she was evading service. When the judge saw that, she said, okay, you can serve her electronically. You don't have to do it in person or have anybody do it in person. And because I was allowed to do that, I was able to email her the serving documents, the summons, and now she was compelled to come to court. And if she didn't come to court, there would have been a bench warrant for her arrest. That kind of information alone can transform somebody's life because there are many people, and we saw it when I was sitting in court waiting for my case to be called, many other cases being called, and usually it's men stalking women in, in violent situations, and they're trying to serve this person a summons so they can come to court so they can answer to this anti-stalking order and, and be up under the jurisdiction of the court. But the male is hiding from, you know, service, you know, people process service and so forth, but they were unaware that you can file a motion for alternative service. So you can just, you can serve him through an email or a text message. And now he's forced to come to court or he's going to jail. That would, you know, transform millions of people's lives just to get that bit of information, as well as the various things that we've had to go through with the appellate court, Supreme Court, you know, a number of different things, defamation lawsuits and all of that. So we want to show people how to navigate. So that's why February 20 was important. I decided I'm not going to wait any longer and I'll put forward 13 part series. Now, so I just wanted to give that background just for people who are unaware, but you can watch that entire 13 part series. We go into detail about everything that has happened over the past five and a half years, showing the court orders. You know, when she was convicted, when she went to jail, when she got out, when she violated the order, the emails, the documents that she sent to the state of Kansas and, you know, filing lawsuits with the United States government and threatening the county, Jackson County clerk, trying to force the people to leave her town and so forth and giving them 30 days to leave her town. All kinds of nonsense. Talking about her son being decapitated and being impersonated by an imposter and so many different things you just would not believe. So we go into detail about all of that. I put out the 13 part series, um, but then I realized that, you know, you know, thousands of people began to watch that. They were blown away by the information, but they were thankful because some people are also going through the same thing. And I decided instead of just being the 13 part series, I need to make a feature film. Um, going into detail about the entire story. And there are a couple of reasons for that. It's one thing to have, you know, documentation like we have in the 13 part series, but to show people in a dramatized fashion what actually took place so they can see and they can make better decisions and they can protect themselves. When they see red flags, they can start making better decisions. If they're in the situation, how do they get out of this situation? It can be very helpful. It can be preemptive as well. So that's one reason just to help as many people as possible when you have a film, you can get out to a number of people, you know, many more people very often than just, you know, a series on a platform like YouTube. The second reason is I've produced two documentary films. So let's show that right quick. So give me one second, I just want to pull this up. And I want you to see my two separate 
um, contrasting images. Okay, so in October of 2018, um, I released my first documentary film. It's called Amaru Kafo Adibisa, African American Ancestral Divination. And we talk about the forms of divination of spiritual consultation that our people preserved in our blood circles in the Western Hemisphere over the past 300 plus years during the enslavement era. So we talk about the different traditions and I'm in the film as well as four of my colleagues. And we talk about the various traditions. For example, the hoodoo tradition we prove is actually the Akan tradition from the Akan people of Ghana and Ivory Coast. Those of us who are Akan people, we were forced into the Western hemisphere. We continued Akan ancestral religion under the Akan term undu, which means medicine from roots, trees and plant life. And also means to be, be you know, spirit possession spirit communication, and so forth. A number of different things, but we go into detail about that. Um, the voodoo tradition is actually the Eve tradition, the Eve ethnic group. In the Eve language, the term voodoo or vodun simply means deity, divine spirit force and creation, divinity. So juju is a Yoruba term. It's the Yoruba ancestral religion in North America. And gangang is the fang term from the fang people in Gabon and Cameroon, who were forced into North America. Wanga, like casting the Wanga, or throwing the Wanga, is an Ovambo term. So, myself and Mama Mawusi Ashakir and Rakit Kajara Niyaya Nebehet and Seshat Tut Ankwajet and Voodoo Queen Kalinda Laveau out of uh, Cincinnati and Georgia and Florida and Louisiana and so forth. And I'm from Chicago. Um, I went to the various centers of these traditions across the country and interviewed and we talked about and they showcased, you know, how these traditions were preserved in their families for 300 plus years as well as myself doing the same thing. So that was the first film I produced. Actually, October 2018, just a few weeks after the individual first showed up at my home in September of 2018, I was already working on this film when she first showed up with her three sons and so forth. Um, but we released the film a month later. Now, that was October of 2018. Now, October of 2023, just a few months ago, we released our second documentary film, Who Do Akan Ancestral Religion in North America? So we go into detail about Akan ancestral religion and culture. The Akan people of Ghana and Ivory Coast, we address an aspect of it in the first film, but this film is about the tradition. We went to ancient Khanid and Kemet, Egypt and Nubia. We went to Ghana in West Africa, Africa, and of course in North America, various places in North America talking about the hoodoo tradition and showing terms like hoodoo and kanje, which is conjure, kanje man, kanje woman, mojo, high John the conqueror, a haint spirit. All these different terms are actually Akan language terms from the Akan ethnic group. We have preser preserved these traditions in our blood circles for hundreds of years here in North America. And it's intergenerational from ancient Kanidi Kemet, Egypt, and Nubia, through West Afuraka, Afuraka, Africa, into North America, unbroken for literally thousands of years up until this very moment. So we're showing how we preserved our culture for thousands of years up into this very moment within our families in various parts of North America. Now, we released these two films as documentaries. Let me show you the first film and how we did that. Hold on a second. 
And now we're going to get into uh, the investment options consultation or cons consultant fee option as well as the investment option. But first, I want to show you. Okay. If you look at this campaign on fundraiser.com, Amaru Kafo Adibisa, African American Divination Film. You see, it ended on August 19th, 2018. We did a crowdfunding effort to finance our first documentary film. That was the image that we were using before we created the film post. So we raised $16,000. It took about a year. And over that time, we were filming and traveling and going to the different cities we needed to go to and so forth. So bit by bit, you know, this was our first film. It's a brand new endeavor for us. But thankfully, we were able to raise $16,000. And that was enough to purchase the cameras and the computers and the software and um, travel to, you know, five different cities and so forth and film and, you know, a number of different things that we needed to do in order to put this first documentary film together. So we did a crowdfunding effort for that. And we also did a, a small crowdfunding effort for the second film as well. Now, let me switch over right quick. Now you'll notice something with this poster that's a little bit different. Our first film and the second film documentaries. The cost is a little bit less. I did the filming um, myself, went to the location, wanted to be authentic to go into the spaces where these ritual practices are, the cities and so forth. I did the filming and so forth. This particular film that we're gonna produce, When a Woman Stalks a Man, Legal System, Mental Illness, Spirit Children, and Hoodoo, is going to be a feature film. So, actors, actresses, so I don't have that technical skill as a cinematographer to have the various angles and so forth and the very important um, expressions of lighting and everything, so we have to hire a cinematographer to really you know, have this thing professionally done with regard to, you know, all the different angles we need, lighting, everything else. Also a video editor, photographer and so forth to make sure everything is tight. We have to have get permits and a number of different things. So the budget is much larger than, you know, a documentary film where we can just go into people's homes and, you know, film and do what we need to do. So if you notice, we did create a crowdfund for this feature film as well, When a Woman Stalks a Man. We initially did that, but there are two things that we wanted to get to. First, we wanted to um, release the film this year. The Risa Tisa phenomenon put forth this notion and, and proved that people are really interested in real, authentic content that's not just entertaining, but can also help them. It has real tangible you know, benefits. She was able to help a lot of people, millions of people. When people hear our story, which is kind of like a male version of what she went through, um, in certain respects, they'll be helped as well. But it will be shocking to a certain extent and entertaining as well, but it'll be helpful. So we already know when she was signed with the, you know, talent agency and so forth, and she had millions of views, hundreds of millions of views on her video series. They're going to make a movie, a feature film about that. And we're pretty sure it's gonna happen around the end of the year, maybe the beginning of next year, maybe around Black History Month, but more than likely around the end of the year. And we wanna make sure that while people are interested in this kind of content, 
it's no need for us to wait until a year or two from now. We wanna make sure we have our film out when people are really interested in this kind of content. Um, we did a crowdfund effort just like we did before and we were grateful enough to be able to raise all the funds we needed for that particular kind of film, a documentary film. Here with the feature film, we have to raise $125,000. So with this feature film, much more money needs to be raised. So we could do it through a crowdfund effort. It would probably take a while to get to that amount, maybe a couple of years even. But we decided to offer an investment option as well as some people, if they don't have the funds to invest right now, you can generate revenue for yourself simply by directing people who are interested in investing and who can invest to us. So people who actually have the funds to invest, you get a 10% return on your investment. We're gonna get into that. People who do not have the funds to invest, but you know somebody, one or more people who have the funds to invest, then you can get a consultant fee upfront simply by directing the individual to us. 10%. So for example, and this is part of the marketing budget for us as well as indie films, this is one of the ways that indie films finance. Part of their marketing budget is they pay people consultant fees to go out and find investors. That's one of the best ways and one of the only ways they can reach out. If they're not millionaires, you know, we have to find investors where we can and to assist us in getting our films completed. So if you found somebody who wanted to invest $5,000 and they invested that, um, you would get a 10% consultant fee or a finder's fee. So you would get $500 immediately. So when they invest $5,000, you immediately get $500. Um, if they invested $2,500, you immediately get $250 the same day. So for those who would like to invest, they invest $5,000 thousand dollars they get a return on the investment by 10 percent. so you get your five thousand dollars back but of course you also get five hundred dollars on top of that um we pay that back once we release the film we're planning to release the film in november around the veterans day um weekend which is like um november 11th so we can definitely once we start filming in late May, early June and so forth, we can complete the filming part portion, the production portion in June or into July. And then the post-production from July to August, August to September, a portion of October, we can complete the post-production. Then we can start the marketing aspect in earnest. And then we can release the film in November around, this year is gonna be a three-day weekend, Vet Veterans Day and so forth. That's also the anniversary of the transition of Okunfo Yao, which is Nat Turner, the Nat Turner's rebellion and so forth, but the transition of that great warrior ancestor, Okunfo Yao, as we call him, Warrior Yao, also called Nat Turner. That was, uh, you know, November 11th as well. So, but that's going to be a three-day weekend this year, and we would like to release the film at that time. And we, we can definitely do that. As long as we have the funds, we can start. Uh, even if we have 50% of the funds, we can start filming um, at the end of this month into the beginning of June, and then we can complete the filming between June and July, and then we can get into the post-production. So if you look at the film flyer right here, that was the original flyer. So this is what took place. And let me just, before we get into that, let me show you. Okay, so you see the disbursement schedule before we get to that.
This is what we just went over. So consultant and investment options. So consultant fee. So return on investment, if you have funds to invest, um, most you know investments, you don't typically have a 10% return. So if you have funds to invest, um, that would be great. A minimum investment of 2,500. Of course, 10% of that is 250. So um, you would receive, you know, 2750 in your your original, you know, investment plus the 10%. That's for those who have funds to invest. For those who don't have funds to invest, but you know one or more people who would like to invest in a film, an independent project, something that's going to be entertaining, but also um, educational and beneficial for our people. Also employing our people, you know, actors, actresses, cinematographers, it's going to be all Black you know, staff and so forth. If you know some one or more people and you direct them to this video, they can watch the video and so forth. They can look at our 13 part series. They can see what's taking place. They're interested in investing. Then you receive the consultant fee. So when they invest, then you receive that fee up front. If you found two people who wanted to invest and they both invested $5,000 each, they're going to get 5,000 plus an additional 500 back and you'll also get 500 as well but you get yours up front because you it's the finest fee and that's helping us to start the process let's look at the disbursement schedule so the consultant fee is dispersed up front and that the reason why you know indie filmmakers often do that is because someone invests we can use the bulk of that money to make payments to the cinematographer, the video editor immediately and start film. Then we take a portion of that $500 if it's 5,000 and give it to the person who found this person because if they didn't find the person, then we wouldn't be able to start producing. So we'll take 500 of that and give it to the person up front. We produce the film, release the film, the return on investment is dispersed upon film release. So once we release the film in November, um, once we start generating revenue, then we automatically start paying back all of the investors. We only need 25 investors um, to, you know, at $5,000 each to reach our goal at a minimum. You know, we can get 25 people can do that. Now, Let's get into how we will pay this, the funds back. And this is unique with regard to the way we are approaching different from certain indie filmmakers. Now, when we did our first film, um, Amaru Kafo Adibisa, African American Ancestral Divination, we released it in October. We screened it here in Washington, D.C. And then we went on a 16-city tour, a run. 16 cities in 16 weeks. We went to Connecticut, Hartford, Connecticut. We went to Philly. We went to Jacksonville, Florida. We went to Louisiana. We went to Knoxville, Tennessee. We went to Cincinnati and Cleveland and Detroit and, um, you know, Durham, North Carolina, and South Carolina. We went to a number of different places, 16 cities in 16 weeks. And what we would do is, again, I, I've published 31 books. I've been lecturing for a number of years. I've lectured in 33 cities across the country, as well as in Canada, and, and as well as in ancient Kanit and Kemet, Egypt, and Nubian, where we've gone on our study tours there and so forth. But as far as uh, lecturing 33 cities in about 20 states. So I have relationships with, you know, the different venues that we've gone to. So 16 of those cities, we went to once a week, typically once a week for 16 weeks, and we went to all these different places. So we would do the same thing here. The difference with regard to us, as opposed to a regular indie filmmaker, a regular indie filmmaker, what they do typically, second, What they typically do is they release a film, 
They put the film, you know, in film festivals, they apply to see if they can get their film accepted in the film festival to be shown across the country in different festivals. Hopefully a studio will pick it up or purchase the film from them or a distributor will purchase it or purchase, you know, a license and so forth and they can get it distributed that way or they'll place it on streaming services and hopefully it gets picked up by Tubi or Netflix or Hulu and so forth and they distribute it that way. Hopefully they can do that. And if they get a lot of streams, they can generate some money or they put it on their own site and sell it directly. For example, Vimeo. Back when we first released our first film, most indie filmmakers were using Vimeo, which is similar to YouTube, but it's a separate site, Vimeo. You place your film there and people can go, just like you do on Amazon, you can go to Amazon and purchase a film or you can rent a film. When you use the little code and you purchase or rent, then you have access to the film. You can watch it whenever you want to. You can do the same thing on Vimeo and indie filmmakers, especially five years ago, six years ago, well, five, five, five and a half years ago. That was one of the go-to sites. You make a film, you put it up on Vimeo, you put the price there for rental and purchase, and then people began to purchase it, watch it, share it, and so forth, and you can make money that way. But most, most of them, they would try to get a deal with the studio, get a deal with licensing, or eventually putting on put it on a streaming service. We would do the same thing. We'll get into you know um, uh, film festivals and so forth, but that's not our first initial approach. We're not waiting around for a studio to pick up our film. We're not waiting around for somebody to see if they can license the film. We're not waiting around for streaming services. We're not simply waiting around to put it on the site and hopefully people will purchase it. When we release our first film, we're gonna do the same thing with this one. We immediately set up 16 cities and hit the road and went to each one of those cities. So you go to a city, rent out a venue for about four hours, screen the film for the first two hours. We would always have a vegan food vendor on site and people would purchase food. We take a break, they get their food, they eat. And then after that, we have a discussion about you know, everything in the film, the symbolism and the lessons and people talk about how they felt and how it impacted them and so forth. We have a good event. And then we go to the next city and we did that. So we would charge, back then we charged $15 five years ago, this time it would be 20. So you see here, November 24th through March 20, or 2024 through March, 2025. Last time we went from November, 2018 to March, 2019, in fact, March 31st was our final screening. It was in Detroit. That was the final screening. And then we came back and so forth. But this time we'll go from November uh, 2024 to March 2025. The only difference is we learned something from the first run. So for example, one time we when we went to Detroit, on Friday night, we screened the film in Cleveland. So that was the screening for that week. That particular week, instead of waiting until the next Friday to of the following week to, um, well, actually it was Saturday night. So we screened it on Saturday night. That was the 15th week. That was in Cleveland. Then the next day, overnight, we actually drove that night. We drove to Detroit. That was Sunday, the beginning of the next week. And we screened the film in Detroit. It was, I think it was like a six hour drive or something like that. And we screened the film in Detroit. So over the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, we did two screens. So we did that a couple of times throughout that 16 week period. But typically we were going to one city per week for 16 weeks. This time we're gonna do it slightly different. We have relationships with over 33 cities. And then there are certain places that we were not able to lecture at or screen and people were asking, when are you coming to our city? And some people were saying, when are you coming back to our city? But some are like, I see you've gone to these different cities. When are you coming to our city? Well, this time we're gonna to go to their city. So the 33 cities I've lectured in, we'll go to all of those plus additional cities where we weren't able to go to. But we're gonna do it different because we're gonna do three cities per week. So for example, I've lectured in Dallas. I've lectured in uh, Houston, Dallas Pan-African Connection Bookstore, Black-owned bookstore, but they have a big event space. Um, um, I lectured at the Eye of Heru Bookstore in Houston. They have an event space as well. 
I've also lectured and sat on a panel in Austin, Texas. And a few years back when we had the first film, we actually screened the film in Austin, Texas. We didn't get a chance to screen it in Dallas or, or um, Houston. I've lectured there before, but when we went on our run, the 16 cities in 16 weeks, that particular time we missed uh, Dallas and Austin. We were planning, I'm sorry, sorry, Dallas and Houston. We were planning to go to it, but then COVID hit and we'll talk about that and everything got shut down. But this time, for example, we'll go back to these places. Dallas and Houston have been begging for us to come back. When are you coming back? This time we'll have a new film. So for example, we go to Houston, screen the film on a Friday evening. The next day we drive two and a half hours over to Austin on Saturday evening, screen the film there. The next day, Sunday morning, we drive three hours, a little under three hours to uh, Dallas and we screen the film in Dallas and then we come back home. So we hit three cities in one week. We'll do the same thing, for example, in North Carolina. Before we went to Durham, North Carolina, we screened the film. That's just a four and a half hour drive from Washington, D.C., four and a half, five hours from D.C. We've gone to Durham a number of times to, to you know, present and so forth. We screened the film in Durham and we came back home last time, but this time we would screen the film in Durham on Friday evening. The next day, drive to Wilmington, North Carolina, screen the film. The next day, go to like Greensboro, North Carolina and so forth, or, or you know, one of the other cities um, in North Carolina and three cities in one, you know, weekend. We go to DC, of course, we're in DC now. Uh, Baltimore, Maryland is only 40 minutes away. So we could screen the film in DC one evening, Friday evening, evening. The next day, drive up to Baltimore, screen the film 40 minutes away. The next day, go to Richmond, Virginia. It's only two hours away, screen the film there. So each week, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we'll have, you know, three uh, cities. In 10 weeks, that's 30 cities. In 20 weeks, we will have hit 60 cities east. And this way, the way we do it is we won't be driving for 14 and 15 hours. We go to places where the central city is here and the other cities are just a few hours away. So we can get to them easy. It's not taxing and so forth. And we've done that before. So even when I was lecturing before the films came out and I was lecturing, you know, I would sometimes drive in eight, nine, 10 hours, 15 hours and so forth to different places, sometimes flying, sometimes taking the train, just depends. But we'll be charging $20 per ticket. That's, you know, when indie filmmakers have their own film and people come out, they expect to pay around $20 for an indie film. You know, so once again, we rent out a space for four hours, always have a vegan food vendor on site and so forth. Sometimes we also have that some people are local and they are artists um, and they have natural soaps and natural hair care products or, you know, they sell their own book books. We'll have a little vending space for them as well and make it a communal event and so forth. So people watch the film, take a break, get some food, and then we have the panel discussion and, you know, people get a lot out of it. They exchange information. It's a good event. So we'll do that, you know. In 10 weeks, we hit 30 cities. In 20 weeks, we hit 60 cities, $20 per, per event. 100 people come out, 20 times 100, of course, it's $2,000, $2,000 Friday, 2,000 Saturday, 2,000 Sunday on average. So that's $6,000 a week, um, you know, for, you know, for a weekend. Um, now, if you take away the expenses on average, it may be like, Instead of making two thousand dollars, we may, you know, make seventeen and spend three hundred and so forth. It depends. Some places will pay for us to come out because they, you know, they have a budget for that, and they're like, "We want you to come out." They will ask us, "We want you to what does it? What will it take for us to, you know, bring you out to our city so you can screen um your film?" Some people have the budget for that. Some people don't have the budget to bring you out but they let you use their space and they won't charge you, you know, to rent the space because they're just glad that a number of people are going to come out to their space, their business. And then you have some people who can't afford to do that. They will charge you for the event space and that's fine. So when that evens out, spend about $300 per place. 
So $1,700 per, you know, event. Make 2000 but then minus the, you know, expenses about $1,600, $1,700 per place, $1,700, you know, times three is $5,100. So $5,100 per week. 10 weeks, that's 51,000, of course, in 20 weeks, that's over 100,000 and so forth. And then we do another five weeks, say in April, and then we hit that $125,000. So we'll be able to pay the people back um, the funds plus you know, the 10% interest and so forth. We're not sitting around waiting for Netflix to pick up our film. We're not going to pitch the film. We'll we'll send the film out. And if people want it, if a studio wants it, if they want to put it in theaters across the country, fine. We'll do that. But we're not sitting around waiting for that. We have a system. We've been to 33 different cities, plus a number of different cities who, you know, we weren't able to get to. For example, we, in fact, let me share this right now. Show you how we did it. Okay, this is the first flyer for the first film. So we did our 16 cities in 16 weeks, first film, people really loved the film and so forth. And one of the people we were connected to on social media, she reached out to us and said, listen, um, I'm working with a sister who has a film festival in California, in Los Angeles at a major studio you should submit your film. I wasn't even thinking about film festivals at that point, but she said, you su should submit it to see if it would be accepted. We submitted the film, it was accepted, and we went out to Los Angeles. They featured our film on Saturday night. It was on the big screen, a number of people came out. It's a film festival, a number of films and so forth. They also asked us to speak on a panel on race, religion, and social justice, because that was the theme of that particular year's conference. And, you know, festival. So we spoke on that panel the following day. We were on the red carpet and so forth. So it was a good, you know, time. Um, the very next week, we were in Austin, Texas. We sat on a panel at the Carver or George Washington Carver Museum um, dealing with ancestral religion and so forth. And then we also screened the film that, on one night and we had the, the panel discussion the next day. I decided to submit the film to another film festival in New York. And that film festival accepted us, the Ponza Film Festival in New York. And we went out to New York and the film was screened in New York and so forth. Um, that was in December. And then in December of 2019, and then they had an awards ceremony in January of 2019. And we went to the awards ceremony and we won best original documentary. So in January of 2020, we won that, you know, award. So I wanted you to see this first poster because then we were able to change the poster. And this is what we were able to change it to. You see it here. Now. And of course, what's different, of course, is the laurels, the stamps, official selection, Pembroke Taparelli Arts and Film Festival 2019. Official selection, Kwanzaa Film Festival 2019. And also winner, best original documentary, Kwanzaa Film Festival 2019. So our first time out with the documentary, we get accepted because, you know, you can submit your film to a number of different festivals and that doesn't mean you're going to get selected. Many people submit their films and they don't get selected. So getting selected in and of itself is an accomplishment because, you know, sometimes there are hundreds of, you know, submissions, sometimes more than that, and you get selected. And then we also, that means it was good enough that they feel like we should put this on a big screen and have our people come out and pay to see these films, including yours. Um, then we won best original documentary out of you know a number of different submissions. 
So now we have a credential. We have an award-winning film. You know, people have critically acclaimed the film. So because we had that in January 2020, and we had just did 16 weeks, and remember, I've done 33 cities. I'm like, we need to go to these other 17 cities as well as, you know, some other cities that we haven't been to. So we started planning to go to those other cities. And the first one we were going to do was in Philadelphia, and then we're going to do Washington, D.C. in theaters. We're going to rent out some theaters in different cities so a larger group, two, three hundred people can come out and see the film. So the first one was going to be in Philly in March of 2020. And then COVID hit in March of 2020. And all the movie theaters across the country were shut down for the next two years. So no more going to films and so forth. But still, we had a we had a good learning experience. We went to those first 16 cities. We were able to get the film out there, set up, you know, establish a piece. Hold on one second. We were able to establish, you know, a uh, track record and so forth. And, you know, we, we understood what we were doing. So now, two and a half years later, you know, things start opening up. I released the new Hoodoo documentary back in October. And I was about to go do the exact same thing. October released it October 17th, just this past October. The very next week, October 25th, is when the court date, the trial date for the second criminal conviction for the individual who's been stalking me, that was that trial date. So I was like, okay, we're gonna go to this. Um, it's gonna be over. She'll be incarcerated for multiple violations of this court order. I'll be able to tell my story and so forth. And then of course, as we said, the different machinations that took place and the case kept getting pushed back. But I realized at that point that this was the time, as we said, it was time to make this a feature film, not, not a documentary, just detailing what happened. I did that through the 13 part series, but it was time to make this a feature film and make this the film that we go out and tour with. So I put the Hoodoo film that we just released on our website, on YouTube, and let me show you that. So this is our YouTube page. And you will see a second. You see that the Hoodoo film is, you know, there. We were selling the film and so forth, but then we decided to put the film out for free and reverse the process so people can see the film for free. And then if they appreciate the film, then they, they can make a donation afterwards. So instead of paying up front and watching the film, you can watch the film if you appreciate it. And most people do appreciate it. Then they can make a donation, a payment. Afterwards, they can also access our 31 books. And we have a Patreon group and so forth. A number of different things. But we decided to put that film out in that process, reversing the process, putting that film out for free so people can start watching that film. And with in days and so forth, we had a thousand views and so forth. And in the meantime, we're focusing on our feature film, which is not a documentary, but actors, actresses, the entire piece. And that's when we realized we need to focus on this film to put this one out. And by the time we released this film in November, people just received a free access to our recent film that we just released a few months ago. So when we release this film, we'll be charging for this. We'll set up the, those 20 weeks and going to three different cities per week for 20 weeks and so forth, just going out. People will look forward to not only seeing the film and the subject matter, but they'll be appreciative of the fact that we put the, this film out for free, upfront, free access. So they're looking forward to coming out and supporting the work that we're doing. So. Switch back. Oh, 
Okay, so that's that's the information we wanted to share. We shared some of this information with um, those in our Patreon group and on our regular email list before our subscribers on YouTube who've been following us for either a long period of time or if you're a new subscriber. We wanted to get this information out to you as well. We can begin filming this um, you know, feature film by the end of May, end of May, beginning of June, with just 50% of the budget. So for those who are, are investors and you're ready to invest, um, you can receive a return on investment of 10%. Also, even if you do invest and you, you know, receive 10% once the film is released, and as soon as we release it in November and we start going from city to city, as, as soon as we start generating the funds from these ticket sales and so forth, and some of them will be pre ordered and so forth. So when we set all the different dates up, you know, we'll have pre-orders. And we do that typically anyway, because there's a certain amount of people who can fit in a venue. So we put put it out on Eventbrite and people pay for the tickets up front. We don't wait, we don't wait until the day of, we don't allow people to, you know, purchase tickets the day of. Because you know you can rent out a venue and then you know people aren't able to make it, something happens and so forth. So they're pre-ordered, so we know exactly how many people are coming, have the space ready and so forth. And once we start getting these pre-orders, we start paying our people back. But we're going from city to city to city, just like we did with the first film. We're going to do it with the second film, and we start paying people back. So if you're ready to invest, for those who are ready to invest, you get a 10% return on your investment as soon as we start you know, going from city to city. Also, if you, in addition to that, if you know of one or more investors and you refer them to us, just tell them to let us know that you were the one who referred them and you will get your consultant fee up front. You won't have to wait until November. You'll get your consultant fee 10% up front as well. If you are not ready to invest at this time, you don't have the funds to invest, but you would like to generate revenue for yourself as well as assisting you know, an independent, you know, film and so forth. You know, anybody you direct to us who does invest, let them know it's a minimum investment of $2,500. Um, then as soon as they invest, then you receive your upfront 10% fee. That way you can, you know, generate some income for yourself on a part-time basis, but also assist us in getting this film out in a timely fashion. And the same for those who invest, you know, who are ready to invest, you'll get that 10% and you're also assisting us in informing the community, empowering the community, and obtaining the community through uh, a feature film such as this. We already put out a casting call for the first, some of the major characters, and you know, roles in the film and so forth. We're going to put out another casting call later this month, um, starting the casting process, which is the pre-production so that we can move into production to start filming and then the post-production and so forth. So um, please send this information out. And again, we only, with the, most people would, uh, you know, invest 5,000 or more. With that, we can do that in 25 with 25 people. But even for those who invest 2,500 or 3,000 or whatever, um, even with the first 15, 20 people and so forth, we can start shooting to make sure we while people are in this mindset of enjoying this kind of content as evidenced by the sister who you know had millions of people watching this kind of content that means people are ready for this kind of content again if you told somebody you know last year hey we have a 20 part series or the 13 part series or they may not have been you know so ready to spend that kind of time just thinking about that would be taxing. But since they've done it, they're like, hey, what's the next series? I'm I'm interested in this kind of content now. So I want to say, yeah, I say we thank everybody for listening and supporting. Please share the information and we look forward to beginning to um starting that process, starting the filming process this month. So yet I say we thank you and ye we will meet again. All of the contact information is in the link, you know, description box for this video. Get yeah, awesome.